Welcome back to Her Rules Radio. I'm Alexandra Jamison, your life and body coach in your ears. Thanks for listening to the show. I know you've got a lot of podcasts to choose from. And if you're new here to our little community, welcome. Welcome, ruler. I invite you to be in charge of your life. I invite you to live life by your own rules. Today, I want to take you on a deep dive into how to be in your body. It's been a lifelong journey for me, and it's some of the biggest work that I do with women, helping them learn to be in their body rather than obsess or think or just punish their bodies. And it's a long and twisted tale. It's a complicated path, but I'm here to help you make it easier. And at some points in my life, I know that I was lucky. I tended to be naturally thin at many points of my life, though there were many times in my life when I have not been thin at all. And I've always been most comfortable in my skin when I'm in motion. Even today, as a busy working mom, I'm happiest when I get to cut loose and feel free the way I did when I was still a free range kid. And to fulfill that need, I decided that when my kid was younger, I would bike my son to school, weather permitting, of course, you know, Brooklyn, New York City can get hammered with some crazy over the top storms. And, you know, there were some logistics to think about, you know, getting my growing boy strapped into his safety seat while not forgetting part of our essential gear, helmets, keys, water bottles, etc. You know, all that can be a little cuckoo. And once we were on the road, I always felt really good. In fact, once I would hit a certain stride, I felt great. I loved riding him to school out in the fresh air. I loved parking next to the school door and delivering him to his day, knowing that we had started the day off with a really decent ride and getting some quality outdoor time together. And then after drop off, the ride home was a super thrill because without him on board, you know, that 40 to 60 pounds, depending on how old he was, I would pretty much fly. And I was really lucky that I got to do that for several years. But, you know, more than that, that commute was keeping my body happy, helping me stay in top shape. And I know because at a certain point, I would have to stop riding him to school because he got too big. And also it started to be too much wear and tear on my body. And it was a 45 minute ride to get him to school, 30 to 45 minutes. And it started to become too much because I was now riding my bike half the time with a 50 pound kid on the back, sometimes twice a day to pick him up after, after school And it actually was too much work. I was actually starting to work my body too hard. My knee was having problems. My adrenals, my thyroid were taking the hit. With all the other stress in life, I was actually working out too much. And then there were times when I couldn't ride him at all, and I wasn't relying on that to keep me well, and my back problems would return. So it really has been a an ebb and flow of this movement. And it started pretty early in life, this relationship to exercise that has been really complicated. When I was a kid, 12 or 13, I was diagnosed with a significant case of scoliosis, a curvature of the spine. And just like the character in a Judy Bloom novel, I was fitted for an uncomfortable back brace that was like, you know, half an inch thick, hard plastic that I was supposed to wear 23 hours a day. And this contraption was made out of this insanely rock hard plastic. It was wrapped around my hips and my torso in such a way that walking, sitting, and especially sleeping became not just awkward, but painful. And wearing that thing made me so miserable. In fact, in my sleep, I often unstrapped myself to wake up and find the brace on the floor beside my bed. My hips raw and sore. There was just no way to get comfortable wearing this thing trying to sleep. 
And of course, I couldn't wear regular or cute clothes when I had that thing on. It protruded in odd places and nothing fit me. I couldn't wear jeans, short skirts, which were all the other <laughs> girls were wearing. And I might as well have been wearing a straight jacket because the brace made me walk with this stiff gait that only drew attention to the fact that my clothes, which at this point, all I could wear was sweats and loose t-shirts mostly, it just sucked. And this device was supposed to correct my quote unquote deformity, but that's how it made me feel deformed and in pain. It was awful, but I was a dutiful kid and I took the doctor's warning to heart that if I didn't wear it for a full year, I would grow up bent over and misshapen. And honestly, I still have pretty chronic back and neck pain because of the scoliosis. But I did my ever-loving best to stay locked into that awful thing day in and day out, you know, except when, I, of course, I <laughs> took it off in the middle of the night when I was half asleep. But at about the halfway mark, about six months in, I just couldn't do it anymore. I stopped wearing it. I didn't make some big announcement. I just woke up one day, put the brace in my closet, and went to school. And nobody really seemed to notice. But it was at that time of your life, right, adolescence, where you are so hyper-conscious aware of your body, your body's changing. You know, all my friends were developing breasts. I was not. I was still super flat as a pancake. But now I couldn't even try to look cute because nothing fit me around this huge brace I was wearing. And it just made me feel so super hyper aware. I, I still am healing this crazy consciousness that I have around my torso. It actually has taken me years to feel comfortable wearing anything that's even remotely tight around my torso because I've been afraid to draw attention to this part of my body. Right, so these, these traumas that we experience as kids really stick with it. But fortunately, part of my treatment when I was a teenager included weekly chiropractic visits, and these really have helped. The chiropractor gave me a series of exercises to do, stretches that spoke directly to whatever part of my back might be rebelling or in pain or in need of stretching. And, and these included doing muscle building stretches and twists that would try to support my growing spine. And plus, our health insurance covered medical massage. So my wonderful open-minded mom added these to the treatment mix too. I will never forget my first massage therapist. She was a lovely, kind, gorgeous middle-aged woman who wore her salt and pepper hair really long, total like total hippie mama with this like caftan purple dress that she loved. And she really seemed to understand the unexpressed anguish that I was feeling being singled out and labeled as being somehow broken and all this negative attention that was coming at my body. She really, she really tended my body with this loving, sensitive, relieving touch through massage that not only eased the ache in my back, but soothed this ache in my young heart too. With her support, I learned to first acknowledge the muscular pain and tension that the scoliosis triggered and then relax into it while she gently coaxed those deep, tight knots out of my muscles. And she worked on my body with such loving focus that I really experienced for the first time this true body connection and acceptance at her hands. And I know that that kind and healing imprint of her touch was such a huge part of becoming aware of my body and connecting with my body over time. And then there's the other hippie mama that my mom brought into my life. And that was Lilius, the TV yoga guru. Lilius Yoga and You was the first broadcast yoga show on TV in the 80s. And my mom and I used to watch it together all the time. Every morning for many, many years, my mom would arrange herself on our brown and orange gross 70s shag carpet in front of the TV and she'd follow along while Lilius led her through a gentle yet very exotic seeming series of poses. 
And, you know, after I was diagnosed, I used those tools that I learned through doing yoga with Lilius and my mom on the floor. And because I was still young and super flexible, I'd just bend over with Lilius following along as I watched her on TV and just feel all this release and relaxation moving through my body and my spine. And in those moments, even though I had no idea what like breathing into the stretch meant or tilt your pelvis forward, I didn't know what that was. I knew that my back felt better and I was feeling better. I had no idea what namaste meant, but I knew even as a 12, 13 year old that I liked how relaxed and happy my body felt after those yoga sessions. It wasn't until much later when I took my first solo yoga class in college that I learned that namaste, a Hindu greeting, acknowledges the divine life force that is present in each of us, the healing, loving powers that are held within us all, especially when we take time to care for and connect with our bodies by engaging in something as profoundly supportive as yoga. And from these powerful practices and treatments, I learned that physical pain isn't necessarily something horrible that you can't live with and learn to manage and learn to live from. It's often a clear message from your body telling you that you need balance, that you need to heal something. And so I began at this young, tender age to understand that the pattern of pain, relaxation, release was essential to good health. And that breathing through all of these phases, giving each the pain, the relaxation, the release, giving each of them a moment and awareness of direct acknowledgement and respect was the way to health and happiness in the body. At least it was for me, a girl on the cusp of womanhood whose skeleton was growing too fast and was going a little haywire. And it is for me now in my early 40s as I continue to tap into the divine healing power of my own body so that I can rise and walk and play every day. But one of the biggest obstacles to being in our bodies is our brains. We overthink it. Learning to quiet or at least notice our inner critic, that bitch brain, as I like to call it, is certainly a crucial step for relaxing into your body. But sometimes you just need to step out of your mind entirely and let your body do the work of calming herself. If you've ever experienced any kind of physical trauma and wearing that back brace certainly was for me, then you know how hard it can be at times to simply relax because trauma is stored in the body. Think about how your neck and shoulders feel after sitting for a full day at your desk. How do you feel? Is your neck stiff? Are your shoulders relaxed? I guess that, you know, even now, as you're just hearing it, you're drawing your attention to your neck and shoulders for the first time in a while and really noticing how they feel. I wouldn't be surprised to know that as you're listening, you've relaxed your shoulders, you've aligned them with your back and your hips, and maybe you're even releasing the tension in your neck by doing a little bit of stretching. It's amazing what even the slightest bit of attention can do for your body. When you feel into her, we don't connect with her often enough in a gentle healing way. It's all about attention and loving awareness without the judgment, without the insult. Once you've quieted your mind, you become available to listen to your body. And once you begin to really listen, you'll find that your body will tell you what she needs to achieve health. I try really hard to call my body her or she rather than it, which makes her more like my friend rather than an object to be manipulated or scorned. And if you're not picking up those subtle messages, those clues from your body, she will find clever and sometimes even scary ways of getting your attention. Here's the truth. Your body knows. Your body knows. 
All I knew at this moment was that I felt unsafe. For days, even weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling that danger was lurking. And no matter how much I tried to talk myself out of this fear, it just wouldn't leave me. I had experienced this sensation before where my fight or flight response would get triggered over something relatively small. And the next thing you know, I'd be in tears or breathing shallow or like now in this moment that I'm describing, unable to get on the crowded subway car, even though missing the train would make me late. This was a very stressful time in my life. This was a night during a period where I was being separated from my now ex-husband. My anxiety was really high and I had, I realized, become a bit of a hermit, a recluse. And I I thought, okay, I'm going to go out and see some friends. I figured that by getting out and enjoying some playtime with some friends, it might calm me down. And I met up with my girlfriends and we found our seats. We were going to a play at a theater But within minutes, the lights went down, the curtain goes up, and I felt overcome with this feeling of dark foreboding. Like it was hard to breathe. I was hyperventilating. I felt so stuck and hemmed in all of a sudden that I feared I might jump up and scream right in the middle. Like I had to get out of there. I didn't know it, but I was having my first full-blown panic attack. It was really scary. All I knew was that something was wrong. So I got up out of my seat. I scooted by my friends to the aisle as quietly as I could. And then I nearly ran to the back of the theater. By the time I got to the bathroom, I was like starting to sweat. And thank God I had a tool. I knew what to do. And using my index and my middle finger, I started to gently but firmly tap on the outside edge of my other hand on that karate chop point of the outside of your fist. And while I did that, I quietly said out loud, even though I feel panicky and crazy, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. I repeated this out loud as I continued tapping down the meridians of my body on key pressure points, my temple, besides my eyes, under my eyes, below my nose, on my chin, down my sternum and my heart. And I did this tapping. I did this slowly and deliberately keep repeating this phrase. Even though I feel shortness of breath and I feel panicky, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. And I felt my heart rate slow and then the sweating stopped and I was finally able to catch my breath and the panic subsided. I took my time, I sat down, I splashed some cold water on my face, I fixed my hair, and then I was able to go back to my seat and actually watch and enjoy the rest of the show. And all of this took place in about 20 minutes. And over the next few weeks, I would still have some small flare-ups of panic. And of course, it usually hit me when I was getting on the subway, going between Brooklyn and Manhattan, where there's like no escape. And every time even the mildest sense of panic would flare up, I would use this tapping technique and I would make it to my destination in one piece. It really helped me connect and calm. What I was practicing is called EFT, which stands for Emotional Freedom Technique, otherwise known as tapping, which is a simple practice of calming your mind and your body with these strong, loving affirmations while tapping on these key pressure points, these meridian points. It's a brilliant combination of acupressure and spoken word cognitive therapy. Now, I've known about EFT since my days in nutrition school, and I've used it with clients and on myself successfully over the years, but this was the first time I had used it in the midst of a panic attack. I was so grateful that it worked. I was so grateful to have that tool. EFT works to calm the part of the brain that's convinced there is a grave emergency happening right now. And I can attest to how effective this very simple technique is. It's an incredibly gentle way of telling your mind to halt while you redirect your thoughts with those outrageously positive affirmations. It tells your body, because you're saying it out loud, that your body can ignore that urge to fight or flee long enough so you can regain some alignment and calm between your frightened body and your anxious mind. 
And it calms the static. That's what I call it. It calms the static in your brain and your body so that you can actually get back into your body. It's effective. EFT costs nothing. There's no side effects. And you can do it on your own in the bathroom, just like I described. There have even been studies showing that EFT, or as they call it in Australia, meridian tapping, can reduce food cravings. They did an Australian study where they took a group of nearly 100 obese people who were evaluated to determine the intensity of their food cravings, and then they were split into two groups. And one of the two groups was taught EFT immediately and instructed to use this calming technique whenever a food craving arose. The other half of the test subjects were had to wait a month to learn EFT, and they were both closely monitored. And after the initial month, those who practiced EFT had significantly lower food cravings fewer and less intense. And this lasted for over a year. So the study was pretty long and it showed that this EFT can help people who are grappling with overeating and cravings and that it can be a very useful tool in supporting health and weight loss efforts. Now, looking back, I see that this period of extreme vulnerability and fear coincided with discovering that my then husband was having an affair. We had a toddler and not knowing if my family was going to stay intact or what the future held, I, I just felt unsafe. And I was really fortunate that I had a very supportive network of people around me who were helping me to get comfortable with the uncertainty. If I could just stop myself, if I could refrain from like getting overwhelmed and totally overcome with anxiety and fear, then I would be able to get through the storm. And you know what? I did. I I won't lie and tell you that it was totally 100% easy or that the toll on my body wasn't great because it was. In fact, I had to scramble to learn about myself in deeper and more important ways than I've ever been called on to do in my life. The collapse of my marriage brought up a lot of pain and fear, but in the end, it brought me to a place of greater inner strength and awareness of what I wanted my life to look like. It gave me the opportunity to get really honest with myself in ways that I just hadn't ever been called on to do before. My marriage failing forced me to find myself, and I wouldn't trade that experience for anything in the world. But it was a process. Getting back into my body after my marriage broke up, I often felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. My my body seemed incapable of much sensation. So I just I, I was really depressed. I dragged myself through my days without experience much physical pleasure at all. Plus, my scoliosis back pain returned. You know, I was carrying my son who is now almost two. You know, I was carrying him in a sling. I was carrying him on my hip and my spine was just really not having it. On top of all that, my lovely bitch brain was back in a new way. She had a different voice. She was determined to blame me for the end of my marriage, to make me feel like a total shit about myself. And I found myself inching deeper and deeper into depression. And I noticed that I was beginning to self-medicate with sugar, caffeine, TV, and complaining, complaining to my friends, all habits that would lead me nowhere I wanted to be. You know, I knew enough to know that all of this in my head was toxic and what I was doing to my body was not going to help me. So I tried something different. I signed up for a Pilates class at the local YMCA. I love the Y. And Pilates is a type of physical conditioning that, you know, increases flexibility, builds muscle strength, and emphasizes spinal and pelvic alignment. And like yoga, Pilates calls for mindfulness and attention on the breath as well as movement. It's very slow. It's very deliberate. And it's a system that promotes developing a strong core or center, which emotionally I really needed, as well as focusing on those back muscles. So with a mat practice, which is what I really loved at the time, the resistance 
that builds muscle come from comes from your own body weight. So over time, a Pilates practice will not only keep your spine and your muscles that wrap around and support you strong and flexible, it keeps your bones strong too. And think about that. You know, think about where I was. I was depressed. I felt afraid. I felt unsure and secure. And choosing Pilates now as this strengthening, grounding, rooting, bone, strengthening, muscle, core, strengthening process and exercise, it helped me physically feel more resilient. At first... (laughs) I was I was a little like irritated like this is so subtle how can this be helpful but fortunately I had a great teacher named Lauren who understood that most women brought a lot of emotional baggage into her studio as well it's not just physical and Lauren has this wonderful beautiful strong serene presence And as she moved through the class, tall and straight and confident and speaking to us with this firm but loving tone, she really, she really was there for me. She would encourage me to move out of my head and let my body do the work, feeling into my body, not thinking about my body. And the hardest part about being on that Pilates mat those first few weeks and months was really learning to feel and trust my body again. I was really experiencing and feeling my ex-husband's rejection in every cell, and it was showing up as pain and discomfort. And Lauren really encouraged me to close my eyes when she gave instructions so I could locate within my body what she was asking me to do. And it's amazing how understandable being asked to wrap your abdominal muscles around your front torso like a corset how understandable it is when you can see it in your mind's eye and feel into it rather than looking down at your body trying to figure that out. So remember when I finally understood in my body when she asked us to lift our pelvic floor as though it's an elevator rising and I started to be able to connect to and appreciate different parts of my body, these different muscle groups that I had never connected with before that supported my belly, others that hugged the spine, those that were part of the pelvic region. And I started to feel alive again in juicy, even sexy ways. And being on my back on the Pilates mat for an hour, a couple times a week was making it possible for me to rise and walk more freely, more safely, and more securely in the world. I really was finally coming back to life and I began to trust myself and to trust being in my body again. And this exploration of learning how to be in my body has evolved in the last couple of years through dance. Now, I have always loved watching dance. Like, I will go to a dance performance and just start sobbing. I'm so overtaken by the beauty of dancers when they move their bodies. But I have always felt like such a klutz. And it probably links back to being an adolescent and being in that horrible back brace where I felt so ungainly. So being in dance classes has always been really, really challenging for me. Following choreography, not easy for me. In fact, I feel like a total klutz. But I love the music. I love getting down. I love the buzz of in my body and, you know, feeling the emotions and expressing them through my body when I dance. But I also hate the mirrors that are in most dance classes. They make me feel uncomfortable. I don't like having dance mirrors around because then I start looking at my body rather than feeling into my body. And that's when I discovered M-Body. M-Body is a kind of dance that my dear friend Nadia Munla teaches. I went to a couple of her dance classes and I fell in love with it. This is a style of dancing where it it really meets you where you are. It's for everyone. You can have all levels of quote unquote dancers in the room and there's no mirrors. There's no choreography. It's really a process of embodying your soft side, embodying your rebellious side, embodying your primal side, and then your sensual side, and then your angry you and your passionate you and your inner child. So it's a wonderful way of exploring 
how you feel, how you want to express your body based on the music and the, you know, express your inner child, the teacher will call out. In fact, I loved it so much that I became certified to teach Embody with Nadia. And you can go check it out at embodydanceclass.com and learn more about it if you like. But I have loved the, the expression that women discover in an Embody class. And it's the really wonderful additional tool for us to be in our bodies rather than thinking about our bodies so much. And this is so much of the work that I do, helping women to feel and listen to ourselves. I believe that your soul, your truth, your higher self speaks through your body and that you absolutely have the ability to listen to her, to feel her, to become her ally, to become best friends, to become a solid team together. And all it takes is some exploration. Really, that's all it takes. I could go on and on about ways to really connect with and be in your body. But for now, we're going to leave it here. And if you want more, I really encourage you to go get my book, Women, Food, and Desire. This best-selling book has been raved about by thousands of women around the world. So proud of how this book is helping women get in touch with their bodies. You can go download the first two chapters for free at bit.ly forward slash women free desire. You can also download the book for free as an audio book. I read the entire book to you in your ears. You can go to audibletrial.com forward slash cravecast, C-R-A-V-E-C-A-S-T, and download the book, listen to it. And if you like listening to audio books, you can then download more books as you go on with their service. Thank you so much for being here. We'll be back next week. And if you love the show, do me a favor. Go share it with some friends, copy that link, throw it up on Facebook, send it in a text. However, we need to get some more listeners. We need to share these messages with more and more women because the more women that feel connected to their bodies, the better the whole world is. You know what I'm saying? See you here next week. Mwah!